Uh, good day to one and all. I am Dr. Rohit Gopinath and today we will be talking about a topic which is of great importance as a pediatric, as far as a pediatric surgeon is concerned. It is esophageal rupture and perforation. Now, even though this topic, this condition is not very common, it still presents a very important diagnostic challenge, particularly if it occurs spontaneously. Boy hair syndrome is a common terminology that we have come across multiple times in medical practice. So, boy I have first described this condition based on the post-mortem findings of a patient whom he encountered way back in 1724 and the patient was Admiral Baron Jan van Wasnier. So, this Baron after having consumed a lot of food during one of his uh, parties subsequently went about retching and bringing out the food. Post retching he is said, said to have developed sudden onset distress and collapsed and he was then found to have an esophageal rupture. So, Boyhav described his condition way back in 1724, like I said, and he described the terminology spontaneous post emetic esophageal rupture based on this finding in his patient. Once this condition was diagnosed, it was uniformly fatal until around the early 1950s, 1960s when surgical techniques improved and primary closure of esophageal perforations were made possible. Five Fogel was an individual who way back in 1958 demonstrated the presence of a spontaneous piece of facial perforation in a neonate. He was able to successfully repair the perforation and the child went home well. Then in the early 1960s, Eckloff and colleagues demonstrated an iatrogenic injury to the cervical esophagus while inserting an NG tube. This again injury was identified early and was corrected surgically. However, he then went on to propose that early esophageal, upper esophageal injuries can be managed conservatively as well. So, with a little description regarding the history of this particular condition. So, coming on to the classification and incidence of esophageal injuries or ruptures. Now, an esophageal rupture or an esophageal perforation it is very important to know what exactly these terminologies mean. So, in both these, both an esophageal rupture or a perforation, there is an abnormal communication into the pleural cavity, mediastinum or the peritoneal cavity. Now, esophagus is very unique in the way that it passes through multiple body cavities. It starts off in the cervical region, passes through the thorax where it is in contact with the mediastinum, with this in the mediastinum and it is in close contact with the pleural spaces enters into the peritoneal cavity. So, uh, you find that it can injury to it, a perforation to it or a rupture of the esophagus can affect multiple body cavities. Now, the difference between an esophageal rupture and an esophageal perforation, it is very important to know what the difference is. So, the difference is that an esophageal rupture occurs spontaneously. So, it can be said to be a spontaneous esophageal perforation. So, an esophageal rupture is also called a spontaneous esophageal perforation. It is, there is no instrumentation involved, there is no inciting factor in the form of a trauma which produces this kind of an esophageal injury. It is also known by other terminologies like Boerhaar syndrome, effort perforation or esophageal apoplexy. So, the presence of a spontaneous esophageal perforation should always raise the suspicion of the presence of an intrinsic anatomical abnormality or a dysfunction involving the esophageal wall. There is an extremely rare condition called eosinophilic esophagitis which is characterized by progressive dysphagia and the child also has extensive infiltration of the mucosa and submucosa of the esophagus with eosinophils. This condition can be assessed with an upper J endoscopy and diagnosed with an endoscopic biopsy. An upper J endoscopy will demonstrate the presence of vertical grooves and circular esophageal rings along with an edematous erythematous esophageal mucosa and the biopsy will document the presence of extensive infiltration of the mucosa and submucosa with eosinophils. So, this condition though rare can predispose to spontaneous esophageal perforation or esophageal rupture as it is called. So, esophageal perforation as such unless and until it is, pre it is preceded by the terminology spontaneous is always traumatic. So, this trauma like I said earlier can be anything from an endotracheal intubation 
wherein we can accidentally injure, intubate the esophagus instead of the airway or an esogastric tube insertion or it can be a scopy and per GI endoscopy or it can be uh, a penetrating or a blunt trauma to the esophagus. So, either way there occurs a rent in the esophagus and this rent is preceded by a trauma. Spontaneous esophageal perforation though rare we find that its occurrence is around 4 percent of all cases in neonates making it rarest among the rare. Esophageal perforation is common during upper J endoscopies more common than it is documented in fact and it can occur in 0.4 to 1.2 percentage of all endoscopies that are done. So, what are the clinical findings in a patient with an esophageal rupture or a perforation? So, first let us take into account a spontaneous esophageal rupture. In a neonate with a spontaneous esophageal rupture, these you find that these children are predominantly full term babies who are born via naturalis or LSCS without any perinatal untoward events and after delivery these children can develop respiratory distress with cyanosis immediately or over a period of time. So, why do these children develop respiratory distress? It is because a spontaneous esophageal rupture or a perforation can result in a pneumothorax which is very common on the right side. This pneumothorax can proceed to form a tension pneumothorax resulting in acute onset distress. So, why does it occur on the right side? Why does a pneumothorax occur on the right side? It is because in an infant you find that the left side of the esophagus is supported by the iota, it is closely adherent to the iota and it is supported by the iota. Hence, the right wall of the esophagus you find is more supple or liable to get ruptured spontaneously and hence a right sided pneumothorax is more common. This pneumothorax distress or pneumothorax you find that worsens after the first feeds. It is characterized by presence of vomiting, coughing, choking and sometimes even hematemesis.